So, um, it's very good to be back in San Francisco, in the smoke. <laughs> They've given me 20 minutes to talk about what I've spent the last 20 years of my life doing. Uh, and all things being equal, the next 20 years of my life as well. So, um, I will get on with that. Painted dogs, it's a species that very few people have seen in the wild. It's a species that very few people know and understand. But I'm going to try and change some of that today and illustrate to you just why they are so special and what we're doing out there in Zimbabwe to protect them. So here's a little video. So that those of you, this is as close as many of you may get to seeing them in the wild. Very typical, very playful, typical behavior from the dogs. Even adults play and enjoy a lot of social interaction. So the dogs, there are fewer than 7,000 painted dogs in the wild. Uh, they only exist in Africa. And to put that into some kind of context, where we work in Zimbabwe, there are 80,000 elephants. And we have 700 painted dogs. In Wangi alone, we, there's 40,000 elephants, and we have about 160 painted dogs. So though all species are threatened and face their own challenges, it's clear when you're talking about extinction and the race to extinction, which species is likely to win, and it's this one. The threats to them are very, are, are, are very enormously from location to location. You can summarize it all as uh, habitat loss, loss of quality habitat, but the, the reasons behind that are varied. In our uh, immediate area, poaching is a huge issue. People setting snares to, for bushmeat, but the dogs themselves are incidental victims into that. And there is no doubt that unless we take action, they will become extinct in our lifetime. So what, we have a fundamental belief at Painted Dog Conservation, all directed at the individual. The individual is so important. Whether that's a person, a kid that comes to a bush camp, uh, a, a lawyer that became a, a politician for the Green Party, an individual. Individual dog, saving an individual's life, or changing an individual's life one day at a time, makes a huge difference. And you're part of that. So many in, you, in here, supporters in many ways, have been out to the project. And, and in most cases, we would welcome you back. There's one or two exceptions. <laughs> in most cases, you're very welcome to come back. Engage with us, be part of what we're doing, be part of the team, be part of the solution. And I'm going to show you today exactly what it is that we're doing and how we're changing lives to save this wonderful species. But I'll tell you a little bit more about the dogs themselves. There's a lot of myths, there's a lot of stories about the dogs. And you'll see, I'm producing a book with a colleague, a friend of mine, and in there, we've got so many, we've dug up all the background stories about how they were shot, persecuted, all the lies that were told and talked about and publicized about the dogs. Some, I don't know if he's in here now. Somebody just came up to me and showed me a book that's got uh, illustrations from San Francisco Zoo over the years. And in there, there's a picture of the dogs, painted dogs, and it's talking about the hyenas. And that's San Francisco Zoo many years ago, I must admit. So here's a typical scene that you will see out in the field. Do dogs don't go around eating everything in their path. This is very normal. The dogs have been hunting. They're relaxed, not interested at all in the antelope species. And certainly the impala in the background are very much 
on the menu for dogs, but you can see that this is a normal situation. The pups are everything to the dogs. All of the adults look after them, they feed them, they care for them, they protect them. And that care and protection extends even to the old, the sick, injured dogs. I don't know if Catherine and Rob are in here, but they were in Marna Pools earlier. There they are. Earlier in the year, and there were five, six of the pack limping, injured, and they were really worried and distraught and everything. Two months later, they're all fine. They're alive, they're fine, they're healed. The pack have looked after them, they've fed them, protected them until they've recovered. And that's typical. We can learn a lot from the dogs. If our society was as caring as their society, life would be better for all of us. So, little clip here, and this is those of you who know me, this is a really emotional clip for me because this is Socks. And Socks, those of you who get my newsletter know that she was killed this year by, li we think, by lions. But this is just a little clip to show you life at the den and uh, how the pups and Socks at the den. And some of you have seen Socks. Howie and Aaron are here, they've seen Socks. Rob and uh, Catherine. So that's just a little clip. Life at the den, very peaceful, happy place to be. They're not hyenas, despite what San Francisco <laughs> Zoo. And just in case any of you are confused, the hyena is the one on the right. <laughs> I'll be asking questions later, so pay attention. Eh? They're not even a relative to hyenas, not even a close relative, they're just not related. They're a very different species. Individually, a hyena itself is a much bigger animal. A hyena weighs 100 pounds or more in your language, about 50, 60 kilos in my language, and the dogs weigh almost half that, about 30 kilos, 50, 60 pounds, somewhere like that. But it's all about numbers. It's a numbers game for the dogs. They live in packs, highly social, packs of six up to 30, and beyond, all different age groups, the, the adults and then various offspring of different ages. They're not related to domestic dogs. Not even, they're a very distant cousin. Though a lot of the behavior that we see reminds you so much of your dog at home, of Lassie or whoever that might be. But they're not closely related. Again, I put that into some sort of context. We're related to baboons, and we know a lot of people that you could describe their behavior. That guy is, <laughs> I think Steve's in the audience somewhere, very good example of what I'm talking about, a bit of a baboon when he gets going. It's not the same thing. They're not related. Like as we, they, are, they are as related to, to domestic dogs as we are to baboons. So we're talking about life-changing experiences. This is my son, who's 10. Where's Aiden, who's 10? Future conservationist down there. So this is my son, Aiden. He's, he's called Sam, 10 years old. He's often out with me in the field, helping. And it was, I was even younger than this. I was eight years old when I watched that documentary on TV, Jane Goodall. The documentary is called Solo about the dogs, the painted dogs in the Serengeti. And that is a really powerful memory that I've carried with me my whole life of watching that documentary, glued to the TV, little black and white TV in those days, because I'm quite old. <laughs> Going, fast forwarding many years, I ended up in, I was in the UK still, and I was living with a, partner, girlfriend at the time, and we were decorating the apartment. And I was stood on one of those little step ladders, and I had this, tr you know those trays that you have the painting and the roller and everything, and I'm like, I'm painting the wall, stood on that thing, and I'm just like, oh God, no, really? This, I'm like, this is not what my life is going to be. And I put everything down, said, we need to talk, and that didn't really go down very well. <laughs> but a few years, not long after that, a year or so later, I was in Zimbabwe, 
and Painted Dog, 20 years later, Painted Dog Conservation has become a reality. We're situated in Zimbabwe. Has this got a pointer on it? Yeah, there we go. So here's Wangi National Park. This is where we conduct most of our activities, our bush camp program, where I'll tell you about our anti-poaching in, in particular on the, on the boundaries of the park. Um, we do work up in the north here, minor pools. That's one of the last stronghold populations of the dogs. And it's that, those dogs up there in particular that we're featuring in the book that we're producing. And then there's another strong population in the south down here and a very good program that is being run there. Ispot is one of the first dogs that I ever saw. Like Rebecca said, I went out to Zimbabwe. I'd been to Africa many, many times, never seen the dogs, always wanted to see them, had never seen them. Went out to Zimbabwe, Ispot was pretty much the first dog that I saw and followed for two years. Jealous, those of you who've been out to the project, you know Jealous, he's been here with me many times. And we were the anti-poaching unit, we were everything. We were patrolling the bush, collecting snares around their den. But he's, his brother, Arrow, was the alpha male with an alpha female crescent. And an arrow got killed in a snare. So now I spots on his own. He's hunting, 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 feeding his brother's kids, his nieces and nephews, I guess. And Crescent leaves the den. She goes out to help him. She gets snared. Luckily, she didn't die. The snare was on her leg. And later, we managed to remove that snare. But he raised all of his brother's pups to adulthood. The next year, He's now the alpha male. He had a litter of pups himself, raised all of them to adulthood. Great success. Things are moving forward. The next year, they all shot and killed by farmers. And his life is featured in our visitor center here in Wangi. And his life story is the centerpiece of our visitor center. We use to educate the local children and visitors from all walks of life and nationalities, but the center features not only the dogs, but all of the animals that live in the system, in Wangi National Park. And the relatedness, the connectivity, nothing lives in isolation. Again, individuals changing a life, one life, one day at a time. This is Vusili. She came as an orphan, to our rehab facility. We kind of knew her, didn't know her very well. Clearly, we knew there was a problem. She was starving. We brought her into our rehab facility. We integrated her with an eclectic bunch of orphans, injured, rehabilitated dogs, and we released them into the wild. Socks. She had a litter of pups. Socks was one of those pups. Socks pups have had pups. And the pups, pups have had pups. We can trace 137 individuals back to Vusili. That one action, that one intervention, intervention to save one life has resulted in 137 other lives that populate Wangi National Park today. This is, snares is something we deal with all the time. It's the, in our area, it's the biggest threat to the dogs. This year alone, one pack, I think Howie and Aaron were involved in one desnaring operation. One pack, seven dogs have been snared in that one pack. But because of our resources, because of your help, we've got to each and every one of them. And we've deployed our anti-poaching units into those areas to sweep and clear those snares away. Right now, there's still one in our rehab facility. Often, just removing the snare and under, you know, carrying out some rudimentary first aid is enough to save the life of that individual. But sometimes we do need to bring them in to our rehab facility and we, we may need to put them on a course of antibiotic for five days or something like that, which is easy in our rehab facility, it's impossible in the wild. Often it's just a case of a bit of rest and recuperation for them, feed them very well. And they calm down quite quickly, quite easily. And then 
we release them back into the wild. If, the, if their pack is still there, we'll release them back to their pack. If there is no pack, we'll just release them anyway, and they will find and other dogs in the end. And people ask me all the time, how do you do that? Is it difficult? Is it easy? It's like this. This is Rob's video. Is it Rob's video or Catherine's? Oh, Catherine. Oh, my God. Now I'm in trouble. It's Catherine's video. That's how easy it is. You open the gate and let them go. And they come out, they look around. This is Fran. Socks, this is Socks' daughter. You look around, thank you very much. Off I go. And she, Socks, kind of hangs around. She comes back now and again and goes off, comes back. Very relaxed. And what it really shows us as well, that there's, there's no negative association from the dogs that have been in our rehab facility. As soon as they come out, you can see how relaxed she is. It's not, it's not like she's bolted and headed for the hills. And, you know, I'm free. God. And she's like, oh, okay, fine. Thanks very much. Thanks for looking after me. I'll see you later. When you do intervene, when you get involved in these situations, it's a really powerful, really emotional experience. And you certainly you don't do it out of any sense of self-glory. You're taking that animal's life into your hands. And it's a really powerful sort of act of nature, if you like. And nothing else matters. Right at that time, nothing else matters other than the life of that dog. Because you can choose to do nothing. You can choose to ignore it. This is nature. A snare's not nature. But we deal with broken legs and injured dogs, and we'll bring them into our rehab facility. And many people say, you shouldn't intervene. That's nature. And I'm like, to hell with you. <laughs> because the dog, they're an endangered species, and that's because of us. Nothing else. We have created that situation. So if I can do anything, if I can save one life to try and redress that balance in a very small way, then I will do it. And I, I'm, you know, as I say, though you don't do it out of any sense of self-glory, when you have intervened and it's all gone well and successful, you do have a really strong sense of who you are as a person and why you're here. But we deal with snares, dead animals all the time. We fit these protective collars as often as we can. We had, um, it was, we had, in April, those of you who were here in April or wherever, we were not far from here, we were over the bridge where it's burning now. And we, I had a, a pledge of funding, and I reached out to you then. and said, can you match this? I have a pledge of money, $10,000, can you match it? And you stepped up and you matched it. And with that money, we bought more protective collars. And we're in the process of fitting them now. But as you can see, they don't always work. This, this dog, this snare, is a, around, sort of around its chest, under its armpit kind of thing. So we spend an enormous amount of effort and resources on anti-poaching, removing more than 30,000 snares from the bush. These snares, they're set for small to medium-sized antelope. They'll set, poachers will set snares for a giraffe. If they go into the area and that, they see giraffe footprints as the predominant species that's in those forests, they'll set a snare high up in the tree. It's obviously not a threat to the dogs. So the, the snares that threaten the dogs are the ones that are set for exactly the same species that the dogs are predating on. Their dogs are moving through the forests looking for the same animals, and they get caught accidentally in those snares. These are tough guys. This guy on the left here, Lefius, he's been with me since 2001. We count, I think he's walked 30,000 kilometers or something like that. It's a ridiculous number of, of kilometers that he's walked over his working life with us. We've started to in, engage the help of their distant cousins. We've got two tracker dogs now, and we're, we're still in the training process with them, and they'll patrol with our anti-poaching units 
help them detect snares, help them track poachers down. Hopefully it will scale up the effectiveness of what we're doing there. But education is key. Education is everything to these kids living in rural Africa. We have a world-class program. And these kids, you've got to understand, they live on the edge of Wangi National Park. But if they've had any interaction at all with wildlife, it's probably been negative. It's probably been elephants crop raiding, or maybe lions have killed livestock. So in that environment, why do they care? They don't care. Why should they care? Their life's better if there's no wildlife in that scenario. So we have to change that, because we don't take action to protect anything unless we understand it, unless we love it, and then we care for it and we'll protect it. And that's what our bush camp is all about. Creating that empathy, creating that understanding, creating that love for this wildlife. And then you can start to protect it and you'll, you, people start to take action then to protect something that they love and understand. An example here, this young girl, 11 years old, came to our bush camp. Four days with us, she went back home, and she's walking in the forest near her home, and she found a kudu alive in the snare. She raced back, got the elders, got her uncle and some of the other elders from the village, and persuaded them to release the kudu, not kill it and eat it, release it. And she went further and persuaded them to track down the poacher that set the snares and have him arrested. 11 years old. She'd been four days with us. Her life had changed in those four days. Ten years later, she works for us now in our anti-poaching unit. <laughs> We've got four women in our anti-poaching unit now. She's one of them. And we extend that. We carry on with that education work, that conservation-focused education work in the villages, in the schools. So it's part of their everyday life. They grow up with conservation as a, a daily activity for them. We provide resources, stuff we take so much for granted, although I know you're having a drought here, but it's nothing compared to being out there in Africa. Something as simple as providing water changes lives. Alongside these, that we develop garden projects so people can help themselves. They're not handouts. I cannot stand these aid or organizations that just give handouts, give food. It's, it's so damaging in society there. People, it encourages idleness. It's politicized. Oh, you vote for that party. Okay, well, no food for you. You know, it's, ve it's something that is very readily and easily manipulated. It encourages the poacher. who It doesn't encourage you to go and work in your fields and produce and provide for your family. It encourages you just to sit down and be idle. And idle hands, you know, the rest of that phrase. The art center. Wendy, are you in here? She's very, very small. <laughs> Even if she stands up, you won't see her, to be honest. But with this wonderful lady who, from Berkeley, came out to Zimbabwe and set up this art center for us, using the snares that we our anti-poaching unit have collected. And we've got some on our table outside, and Wendy's got some. She's got her own organization, Africa Matters, and they've got... Um, a lot of these crafts and products out there. And it's a program that supports, it's an income generating project for more than 40 local people. That, that's 400 people cared for, because if you, the average is you know, one, income, sort of, uh, one income earner cares for sort of 10 people is a typical scenario. Domestic dogs, love them. But we, and we vaccinate the domestic dogs against rabies and distemper. They are the source of 
rabies, the disease, rabies in distemper that, into the wildlife population. So we don't vaccinate the painted dogs. You can't do that. So we vaccinate the domestic dogs. Rob and Catherine have been there through one of these programs. Just last month, so we, we vaccinated more than 1,100 um, domestic dogs. We're working with Wildlife Vets International. And we can straight and we neuter and spay as many of them as we can as well. And again, it's a win-win it's a situation. We don't want disease coming into the wildlife populations. The people, they don't want rabid dogs running around their villages. They can't, it costs one dollar, the vaccine. I mean, the cost of these programs is obviously much bigger than that, but the actual vaccine per dog is one dollar. But most people can't afford one dollar. And they can't have access to it anyway. So we provide this around the, every year around the villages in our neighborhood. We support the local soccer league, not because I like soccer, but because we can engage with the youth that are involved in the soccer. We can give them something meaningful in their life, something that they care about. And again, we can use that to change attitudes. And when you change attitudes, you can change behavior. Our medical program reaches 20,000 people a year, delivering quality health care to them. T uh, HIV, treatment, testing, counseling, um, improves their life. It changes lives. It saves lives. And we do all of that for the dogs. One life, one day at a time. And it makes a difference. It creates an environment where the dogs, the painted dogs, can thrive. And that's what we do. If we can create that environment, the dogs will do it themselves. If we can take those pressures off, reduce the anti-poaching, we'll never get rid of it. We will never get rid of it entirely. But if we can reduce it to the point where it isn't such a threat, then we will win. And engaging with communities is key to all of that. And working with these programs, delivering benefits day after day, day after day, delivering benefits to local communities from the dogs, from the wildlife. So now when that elephant crop raids or that lion kills somebody's livestock, it's, it's viewed now a little bit differently. It's like, well, okay, that was a bad thing that happened. But we get so much benefit from the wildlife that we'll, we'll accept that, we'll tolerate that. And it's worth w living with the wildlife because we get a lot of benefits from it. And this is a perfect example. A dog was killed in a snare. Jealous, and my education guys took the dog to the chief who was having a meeting and, and laid the dog down in front of the people and said, look at this. This is what you're doing. This dog built that clinic. This dog drilled that borehole. This dog built that classroom. Pays for your kids to go to school. And what are you doing to the dog? And these people then were outraged. And they stood up to be counted. And they formed a volunteer anti-poaching unit. Until to this day, they patrol every day, protecting and clearing the forests around them. They had poachers arrested and excommunicated from the villagers. So they took action, but they only take that action because they see the benefits that are coming from the wildlife. They see how their lives are changing, they see how their lives are improving, and then they're, they're ready to take action under those circumstances. And it's something I'm, I'm working on. This is the local community. We also have safari operators people who own lodges and camps. And one of the biggest problems I have, and I, talk of, I guess this is the equivalent to my soapbox now, because one of the biggest challenges that I have are those safari operators who they'll pump water in front of their lodge to attract the animals for their clients to come and see. But they do nothing to protect, on the whole, there's one very good, I don't know if Wilderness are in here, but there's a great exception, because they are a fantastic organization. And they run anti-poaching units, and they protect their concession in Wangi National Park. But they stand alone 
with that regard. Because so many of them do nothing. But it's changing, like these people have changed. The work that we're doing, that you're supporting, it's changing because of, uh, there's a collaborative effort now they've got together called Conservation Wildlife Fund. And they, this is the operators finally getting together and finally starting to take action to protect that wildlife. So the future's never been as positive as it is now. So we're winning, we're making progress. And you're part of it. You're helping us. You're part of that solution. And you're helping us succeed. Your life will change. If you come to Zimbabwe, your life will change. You'll, you'll shed a lot of tears with us, that I can promise you. But you'll wake up in the morning knowing and feeling, hopefully, that you're doing something good and that you're making a difference in this world. And we need you. Cash, checks, credit cards, doesn't matter. <laughs> Payment in kind. And it's like that, people have skills. It's not always about the money. People have skills. We've had mechanics come over. We've, you know, we've had marketing people, accounting people. People have skills that help us develop and evolve. But we do like money as well. <laughs> and together, we will and we are creating a brighter future for the painted dog. Thank you very much.